WPDS, on the other hand, is very, very detailed. So a WPDS starts to talk about a given well type. So, if I am to weld um, this weld, what is that kind of weld? Butt weld? Butt weld? It is a type of butt weld. Oh, groove weld. It's a single bevel groove weld with backing. So if it is a single bevel groove weld with backing, what are the kinds of things that you'd want nailed down? Angle of bevel. Angle of bevel, nice. Next. Acceptable backing material. Acceptable backing. Nice. Gap size. The size of the gap. Root opening. Nice. Thickness of the plate. Plate gauge. Finish. Finish. Preheat. Preheat. Hit. Keep going. Amperage. Amperage. Oh, yeah. Come on. Uh, shielding gas, maybe? Okay. Triple position. Oh. What about voltage? Fire feed speed. What about stick out? What about travel? Number of passes. Size of weld. You get it? This is a data sheet. So I like to say that a data sheet is the recipe, it's the, the cooking instruction for this weld. So if I end up with a data sheet, it's because I went through a very, very detailed process to get one built. So I, I identified the weld, I did the weld, I had a welder prove the weld, I then tested the weld destructively, and it turned out perfect. That is a, a guaranteed process, it's about a 97% guarantee that if you follow that se sequence, excuse me, you're going to end up with a good outcome. So data sheets are pretty useful pieces of information. They define all the parameters for a given weld and allow that repeatability to be consistent. So when I said earlier, how many of you are using them? Hopefully that will remind you all to use them.
hopefully you have used them in the past and you're just repeating the same process. Uh, hopefully somebody is checking up on you and making sure that you are repeating that process. So that that consistency we talk about in the code and in our production standard is actually maintained. Which brings us to the point, if nobody follows up on these standards, if nobody checks them, then you leave yourself open to chance, risk, right? Human nature, we're all complacent. I'm leaning on the friggin' board. It's probably not a good idea, right? At some point in time, that could cause an injury. So somebody should say, Peter, get off that friggin' board, stand on your own feet, right? That's what they're made for. Uh, if you need to lean on something, sit down. Right? So those are the kinds of things that codes will continually encourage, is that um, good attitude towards workmanship quality or performance outcomes. Okay, so we understand clearly the difference between WPDS, WPS, and we will point to them shortly. Welding supervisor, that is what some of you are already being or are employed as or will become. And most fabricators end up here because typically we, we inherit the job when it is born as a blueprint and we follow it out the door when it ships on the truck. So if anybody knows anything about that job, it has typically been the fabricator and so that makes a natural progression for you into welding supervisor classification. So what you are getting right now is four hours of a three-day seminar with a CWB, which leads to welding supervisor status. Okay, have you done it? You've done it. So you should be teaching this class. <laughs> no. Good for you. Good for you. Well done. When did you do it? Bless you. When did you do it? Uh, just after my third year, so our second year, sorry, so like a year ago. Good. That's perfect. Because I, my next statement was most of you will end up there. And the fact that you're already there, it's just validating that statement. Did you learn anything as a result of becoming a welding supervisor? Of course. Of course? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not following that orientation, so. Uh, well, yeah, of course I did. Uh, but I'm not actually the welding supervisor of my shop. Right. I just have the course under my belt. That's right. I'm glad they sent you, so they've got, a, they've got some, um, some backup, and they've got some more understanding on the shop floor. Because a lot of guys look at codes and they go, I'll never do this. You do it every day. And the true challenge for a code is to get it from the ethereal to the practice. So if we can boil this down to practice so that preheats make sense, certification makes sense, then it's not something that I don't understand and don't apply. So that's why I say you learn something because the more you get into it, the more you start to realize, well, shit, this should be done in first year. It, it shouldn't be something new at third year or fourth year or whatever that may be. Okay, we'll talk about what makes him a welding supervisor shortly. Administration. So we go through and we talk about administration in terms of the process to certify a company, the paperwork required, and then if I have to, how I can um, control that certification. So, you know, do I rescind it? Well, I guess in an absolute case I could because the certification is the responsibility of the organization. It is awarded to a company in trust. So if you break that trust, I could, if I had to, take it away. Uh, but I would go through a process warning you of that. Um, maybe I'd put you into some suspended state, um, but that would be an extreme. 
It's more of a an encouraging guidance than it is a slap on the head. What is required? Um, so there's some paperwork that's required. There's some validation of your, your processes and your equipment that's required. And then finally we get to the validation of personnel. So you're gonna have to do something with some of your people. Uh, to start with, so we need, uh, we need a welding engineer either on staff or available to us. Um, and that's, that's important um, because we're gonna run into some welding operations that are beyond our understanding. We, you know, it's, this is stuff that uh, we've never run into. Somebody says, I wanna weld hard ox to a air plate. First of all, does the code cover it? And secondly, am I qualified to do that? Have I done that? So that's where I might have to go with my welding engineer. So let's talk about divisions. So we can be a one, two, or three division company. So a div one company has a welding engineer on staff. So that means that we are big enough to actually afford a welding engineer as, a, as an engineer specialized in weldments. Um, and so a company like C-SPAN has a number of them. A company like Supreme Steel has a number of them. Uh, Ebco has a number of them. Um, so there are a number of guys uh, around that have a welding engineer on staff. For those of us that can't afford to have a person on salary, we have a retainer scenario. So a retainer means we basically have a standing contract with a person who comes around to the shop infrequently um, I believe it's a minimum of once every six months they have to show up and make a report of what they're doing, kind of work, kind of processes, um, compliance or non-compliance issues observed, etc. But the real key here on retainer is anytime you have a specific need and you reach out to them, you've got that advice. So they don't leave you hate hanging. Um, and I have, in work, I've used the engineer a lot. Um, two years ago, I went to a company on some side work, which was, it was actually three companies in one location, but they were sharing work. So they had one common shop, but they were sharing production activities. So one company did ASME work. Another company uh, basically formed pipe, um, well, and beans. Um, and the other company was a miscellaneous contractor. So they had some problems with codes. They were qualified to 59, 47, uh, 47, 2 for aluminum. Um, they were stepping into ASME work and they were stepping into AWS work. And they said, we need somebody to help us bring all these codes together so that when we do a certification, we only have to do a certification in one process, not three codes. And that's a challenge because as me, turns around and says, well, if you've got a welder over here that's registered with the safety authority and certified pressure B, he's good to go on any pressure vessel we put in front of that person, unless their qualifications are challenged. So 
So provided they've welded in the last three months, provided they are competent in their welding process, they don't have to do any recertification. Just keep welding. All right, CWB says, no, 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 no. You've been welding, that's great, but every anniversary date's gonna come up and you've gotta re-qualify. But, we don't qualify pressure. So I can do a pressure test, but CWB doesn't look at it as a pressure test because they don't cover pressure vessels. AWS turns around and says, well, what division are you? So based on your division, we can give you a qualification of pressure vessels for steel, or pressure vessels for aluminum, or pressure vessels for whatever material you want based on your division category. So that's where we had to sit down and say with the three codes, all right, we understand what you're trying to do here, but what is financially practicable is what needs to be discussed. Because we can't be sitting down here doing fucking tests all day, every day, just to meet standards. We have to make some product. And so we finally ended up with our welding engineer coming to a state of harmony where all three codes would say, yeah, yeah, okay, we like that. If you do that, we'll give you a longer annual period of, of amortization and uh, reciprocal recognition. And it was actually huge uh, to watch the three codes sit down at one table and work together. Um, and that's why I was employed, I guess. If I didn't get to that target, I wouldn't have kept my job. So um, that made sense. Okay, so kind of went a little bit off there, but I think that that is an important thing to understand and that's why we have these engineers on board. Um, we will blast through here. Welding engineers, uh, all I'll say on a welding engineer is they're specifically trained for welding operations. So they're a professional engineer and then on top of that they've done a welding um, endorsement or, or specific welding study. It's about two years at the University of Alberta. Uh, it can be done in part-time studies. And if you're so inclined, I'd encourage you to do it. Um, AWS has a welding engineer program and CWB has some modules for welding engineers, but not a welding engineer certification. Um, so there's some technical data there for welding operations for the engineer, but there's no engineering status, not as a course. Welding supervisor. So the guy in the back of the room, why is he there? Why is he qualified? So first of all, here are the specs. There are seven or eight specs that the welding supervisor would go through. The key one here is the experience. So they have the related experience that's not necessarily welding, but they've been around welding um, well enough to understand an electrode from a bevel prep. They understand the machines. They understand the welding processes. They understand the codes at play. Um, they understand how to interpret drawings. And it spells all of that out for us. So we don't need to memorize it. We just need to know welding supervisors clause seven and 7.1234 all the way eight is gonna get us going. And we can see down here it rolls down. Oh, look at that, 7.8. Almost, I could have seen that before. So that's the qualification for a welding supervisor. And this fits directly into your background and your training. Welding personnel. These are the guys on the ground um, foreign welds. Again, we come back to that motherhood statement, tack welders, welders, and welding operators. Um, that could be 
just a tacker. Um, and most fabricators are going to be tack qualified as a minimum um, because there's no need to certify them to do procedure welding if you're not going to employ them in that capacity. It takes time, costs money, is a bang for buck. On the other hand, if that welder tacker was to be called upon to do a full weld, they could if they're qualified in position. So that's all that's speaking to. Um, qualification of personnel goes on in detail. What do they have to do? Um, and how do they do? So we, if we don't understand that process, they lay out the process. And later on, we'll see that described pictorially. I want to speak briefly about this clause here, 8331. So wherever there is a question, you know, I have one clause says this, and another clause says this, which, uh, which one do I follow? It tells me. Um, so it says here, uh, blah, blah, blah. In this case, qualifications shall include all conditions and limitations uh, limitations on the original qualification, including remaining time of validity or the period of effectiveness of the qualification as specified in clause 8331, whichever is less. So if there's a question on qualification period, whichever is less, that's the guiding light, and then you can talk about uh, anniversary dates after that. Um, now, this one here, like a lot of welders say, oh shit, I passed my test, you're gonna leave me alone for two years, three years, whatever the case may be. Not necessarily the case. You start pouring out crappy welds. 822 says, discretion of the bureau. So if I come along and I watch this guy pouring welds, and you know, his, his mind's not in it, he's running welds without gas, or he's standing on his gas line, or he's not cleaning his nozzle, or he's, you know, pouring out cold lap like you wouldn't believe. I can stop that welder right now and say, your certification is null and void until you research. Simple as that. Because I, my job is to make sure they continue to provide that level of performance. Otherwise, What's the point of the certification? And that kind of, you know, I see a young smart guy on the floor. That's one of those carrots you hang out there. You say, hey, you look like you got your shit together. I want you to go and become a welding supervisor. The more I can train you, the more you are likely to embrace the code. The more I keep this stuff in the closet, the less productive and efficient I become as a company. So it kind of makes sense to hang the carrot instead of beating people with a hammer. And so here's, here's the hammer, but the carrot is the better tool, useful tool. Um, Tack welder qualification used to be two years, now it's indefinite. Um, and as I say, this is the most useful tool out there for, for young fabricators coming along that don't know shit about welding. Uh, you need to get them on board quickly. Um, and also, if you've got somebody on the floor that's questionable and you just want to try them out on a little bit of a test before you get into a procedure qualification, um, this might be the way to do it. Another interesting story, um, in same, that same company that I was just talking about, um, we needed some pressure welders, and so we started uh, doing you know, the Indeed thing and, and bringing people in. I had people with A-level welding tickets from Alberta arrive in that shop and not once, but on a number of occasions where they literally had a little accordion of certifications on pressure. 
and said, great, we need some, some work on aluminum because we were doing some aluminum vessels for diving uh, companies. Um, they couldn't pass the aluminum tacking test. A level. What are you shaking your head for? Well, our shop has had countless guys show up from Alberta claiming A level ticket and they can't run a fucking fillet well. It's pretty sad. It's it's actually quite scary. It's like how does that happen? How do you how do you get through a pressure test? But then I understand that too, because if I'm if I'm in a particular shop and I have Let's say I'm TIG qualified pressure. I have this machine, this booth, and this product, and it's the same every day. Then getting that pressure certification is easy. It is when I take the product and bring it in and change its position, type, and configuration, or the process and the machine supporting the process, that's when it gets challenging. So if the weld must be done with one leg on the table and the other one down here and it bent over, I can fail people. And that's what happens. I bring you into a shop. I say there's a machine over there. Table's over there, Store four plates here, put a two inch tack in. And that's intimidating. And that causes some problems. But if I'm trying to understand if that person knows how to put a machine together and knows how to self start, then that's the test that has been done. And it's conclusive, it's very helpful. I, I let one fellow fiddle around for four hours while I was doing something else in the office. He was down there setting up the machine to do an aluminum weld. <coughs> four hours later, he was still setting up a machine to do an aluminum weld. I said, thanks for coming in. We'll get back to you. I, I, I don't need to waste my, uh, my time with that. It, it, it's, I'm sorry for that person. On the other hand, I don't have the money and the time to spend setting his machine up for him. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't do that if I had the time, I would, but I have other things to do. And, you know, is it, Is it something that I could send them up, set them up with a mentor and, and so on? Sure, if they meet a minimum standard. But if they can't even get there, then that's, that's this is not the shop we're gonna do that. So I love the TAC welder certification. I'm, I see it as a great time saver. I see it as a great segue or starter into the code certification process. Um, and it's efficient from a, from a dollar's perspective as well. Um, done. Welding certification for the welding operators is a different discussion. Different type of welds are done. Different lengths of welds. Uh, and the range of qualification is much greater. That's why we do that, and we will look at that shortly. Typically, extended qualification is two years, um, and you can see that as we go through it. I don't need to cover that. Process is covered. So for most of you guys, uh, you're living in the gas metal arc welding um, category. Uh, it is expected that in this code that SMAW, FCAW, and MCAW, as well as GMAW, are core to the, the discussion. The code also recognizes submerged dirt welding, tungsten, and electroslag, and electric gas welding. 
Um, so the code does make some supporting statements around all of those processes. If I'm using a process that's outside of that window, this code doesn't cover it. It may have something to say about it. That's it. <clears throat> Consumables. Uh, next time you look in the electrode box, you will see that the consumables are covered by E48, uh, which is all about filler mills. So, you know, if I'm trying to weld this to this, I need to understand what this and this is, and then what the bonder is in between those. Um, and with 1800 odd, odd categories of steel, you best follow that up. Because if you want the service condition of the product to be maintained through the welding operation, and stands to reason that that service condition needs to be harmonized in the welding operation. So preheats, arc consistency, stability, position application, all of those things have to be thought about in your electrode selection, which comes from your material type. You can see now we're into nine, which is all about our fillet weld uh, classifications. We're starting to walk into our plate test assemblies, and pretty soon we walk into groove welds, uh, which show up in here as well. And then we roll down into processes. So modes of operation. Manual welding, semi-automatic welding. So what's an example of manual welding? Stick. Absolutely. Tungsten. Absolutely. So we're manipulating by hand operation. JD weld. JD weld <laughs> might be an application, not the one they were thinking about here, okay? But it would be manual, that's true. What's semi-automatic? MIG. MIG? Okay, what else? Robotic? I don't know. Block score? Uh, right? Metal core. Metal core, bingo, good. Could be robotic in some applications. Depends what that robot's doing, right? Um, mechanized, what's mechanized? A spot weld. A spot weld? or resistance rolled weld, where you have a seam weld that's rolled on, on a spot welding machine. What's automatic? Still work? Semi. Yeah. Robotic? Full on robotic. So now we're talking a robot inside of laser curtain and it's going to go around and start, stop, finish, and then pull back. That's automatic. Um, um, a Nelson stud can be considered an automatic weld. Once it's set, boom, comes down, plunges, pulls back out, done. That's an automatic weld. Automatic here is, could I do that multiply, multiple of times consistently, that would be fully automatic. So a Nelson stud in a traditional sense, if I'm just going along, going pull off, reload, would probably fall into the semi-automatic. But if I could do all of that, reload and fire, automatic. Okay, and the only reason for that is um, every time it stops, starts a cycle is the time that you would input a check. So that's where you have to understand what is the process and when do I start checking. Do I check mid-cycle? Usually not. Okay, we're done class, done.
So we saw the abbreviation earlier, now we see the statement of class. Okay, uh, no, I don't really want to do that, that's boring. Okay. This is all straightforward reading, which you guys can do. I want to go down to some pictures. So a lot of data here, the charts that I've just gone flying through are all about, you know, if this guy passes this and fails that and all that, don't worry about that, we'll get to that if you're a welding supervisor. Um, variables, there we go. Okay, we talked about essential variables. So this is the chart that I was talking about, and it comes up on a table. And the article uh, in variables talks about table 11, so that you can go back and forth from clause to table, because it says here's the table for essential variables. But it also points to this is the clause that brought it up. So if you can't remember what clause brought up, this table, then you can go back to clause 3. You can go back to clause 11, 4, 2, 11, 4, 5, 11, 10, 1. And you'll see the same table reference. So you can go back and forth without having to memorize where this was, which is sometimes useful. Sometimes we remember the table instead of remembering the clause, and vice versa. We all do things differently. My point here is, you know, I can't remember what all the process or variable changes are for each process. Well, it tells me. It makes my life easy. So this first one was stick, a change from a basic or controlled hydrogen electrode to any other type of electrode, non-basic or non-controlled hydrogen electrode. That's an essential variable. So if I change that electrode type, in this case, basic hydrogen or not, that's an essential variable. Changing the group classification of steel. What the fuck's that? All steel falls into categories. <coughs> well, maybe it's a really high strength steel versus a very low strength steel. So changing the class of steel, I'm going to change the variable here in this case. Well, what about if uh, I'm talking flux core? Well, you'll notice that the change classification for SMAW doesn't apply to flux core, so I don't have to worry about it. So that's where this chart, table 11, will help a little bit with what's an essential variable. So I'm doing some gas metal, gas metal arc welding, and I want to change gas types. Is that an essential variable? I don't know. Electrodes, transfer, Voltage, shielding gas. A change in shielding gas from a single gas to any other gas or to a mixture of gases, blah, 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 blah. And then it gives me a stipulation. So again, I don't need to memorize this stuff. It's there for you. What is your welding qualification range if I'm certified in steel? 
What am I good to do? What can I weld? What's my range of qualification? So let's say I'm certified class FW 2F. What am I certified to do? FW qualification. Okay, what else? I'll pick. 2 times test, 2T. So if I, if I want to go to inch and a half, what do I do? Bingo! So am I going to make you do a three-quarter plate off the top? No, because it costs you more money. Right? Now I, can I bend test a three-quarter plate? Can I do a root bend on a three-quarter plate? No, because my, my, my punch and die don't work. Right? They're made for three-eighths plates. Okay, so what do I have to do with three-quarter plate? I've got to do side bends mm -hmm. and or x-ray. And three-quarters suggests probably going to be flux core, not gas metal arc. So do I really need to do that? Well, maybe my job is such that we do office furniture. You know, if we saw inch and a half plate, it would be a friggin' miracle. So, this is perfect for me. I'll just do my 3 8 test coupons and get my 2T certification and gold. That's all I need. On the other hand, you know, shithouse fab down the road here, we put columns on the base plates all day long every day, and those base plates are two inches thick, and the columns are, I don't know, you know, 14 at 346. Big, heavy stuff. And the testing's gonna be different. Okay? So, um, how you're qualified and to what you're qualified is important. We'll get to that. Uh, weld quality. Let's talk about positioning and then we'll come back to weld quality in a second. So this is IP questionable stuff. So what does an F qualification look like? So what's the position of a test plate for the F is really what they're saying. Um, so F being the flat weld in this particular case, the 1F uh, a number one fillet positioned properly is in the hourglass, sitting in the hourglass. Gravity pulling it down on both legs. If I'm in the 2F, gravity is working for one of those legs, but the other leg um, has a problem with the way gravity is working on it, so the operator needs to do some manipulation. 3F, no, no uh, gravity helping the weld at all, um, causing problems if anything, and gravity pulling the weld away in the 4F overhead. So those are our F positions for the fillet. Groove welds. Same kind of thing, gravity helping in the 1G, gravity doing some work in the 2, no work in the 3, and fighting you in the 4. Again, 
IP question stuff. People say, well, how are they going to test me on my knowledge of codes in the IP? You know, throw that picture up and they're going to say, what position number is it? That's how they're going to do it. They're going to describe the weld is in the the weld is to be welded in the horizontal position. How will the electrode be positioned? Vertical to the base plate, horizontal to the base plate, perpendicular to the base plate, whatever. Right? They're going to use some, some options. You're going to pick the right one. Um, so that's how they're going to do it. Pipe and or T classifications. So what's going on with our pipe and our HSS, which is the last thing to be added to the code, I guess, in around about the 90s, is they threw in HSS. Um, and then is, is it moving or not? So again, uh, the 1G, uh, 2, and 5, and 6. Um, pretty straightforward, and then we roll down into the HSS. And HSS uh, does the same thing as pipe, but HSS here, typically diagonals um, are in, in this category here, so that's why we like the 45, as opposed to the straight vertical uh, orientation of the coupon. This chart, very important chart, so what is the axis of my weld? And am I actually qualified for that axis? And when am I, re when am I reaching the zone of requiring uh, a new qualification? Um, so they, they give me the chart. They say flat position is everything in the area of A. So um, you go from there. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in terms of how you apply your welds. Resistance spot welding. So as we indicated, we're going to anchor our Q-deck down. Q-deck is that corrugated tin onto which you pour concrete. This concrete floor, if I go underneath and look up, is sitting in Q-deck. So the Q-deck is welded to the top of the beams and then the concrete's poured on top of that. So that is a um, position uh, data sheet, if you will, for uh, the procedure qualification. Um, and it talks about, again, weld size, disposition, um, and what you're doing. Fillet weld qualification test. So this is what a fillet weld qualification test looks like. So this is the person that you want to qualify as a fillet welder. What will they do? Well, they will weld a coupon. Coupon will be 150 long, 150 wide. It will be 10 mil or 3 eighths thick. Um, and again, it gives you some ranging here so that depending what you want to do with it, you can gain the appropriate qualification. Um, weld size is specified, and then where we rip the macro etch out uh, is defined. So we talk about coming in 25 mil, and then making a cut, and polishing that edge, and then looking at it from a macro etch perspective. We don't really want to look at the very beginning of the weld, or the very end of the weld. So you could actually make your coupon eight inches long, cut off down to the, the six inches, and then do your test inside that zone. So if a guy needs to get a little you know, work up and get in there, great. That's all I want out of this. Um, that gets me going. So that's a qualification test, but if I don't want to spend the money on a qualification test, here's the tacking test. So again, 100 millimeter plate square, two of them, 
You can have a hundred of these pre-cut sitting in a box somewhere. Guy walks in and says, I'm God's gift to welding. You should see how well I can weld. Fucking hey, you're hired, right? What do you want? 40, 50 bucks an hour, 60? Because you must be good. You come with wings, right? Well, oh, you ride a gold wing. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> So we, we can get into that, right? But here's a quick and dirty, like two four inch plates. No brainer. Uh, I need guys that can do in the overhead. Okay, put it in the overhead position. Oh, well, it's gotta be done with uh, gas metal arc on one leg. You're shitting me, right? You can't do gas metal arc overhead. Flux core overhead, sure. Whatever. Do it overhead, get the process, rip a weld in there, two inches long, not five, not three, two. If the guy doesn't know what two inches is, make him do 50 millimeters. If he doesn't know what that is, send him down the road to the corner store and buy Slurpees all day. Um, weld size is defined and process, away you go. What's the test? How do you test attack? Snap it in half. It's destructive, we break it. What are we looking for? Uh, pulling parent metal. Huh? You're pulling off parent metal. We're trying to get parent metal ripped out, absolutely. Scott, what else are you looking for? Penetration. Penetration, okay. So what's unique about that penetration? I wanna make sure it's taking off the sharp edge of plate that's actually in the roof. Right, and it's gotta be consistent. I think that's the key. So let's say this is our stem and we tore it off and it does this. It's only really penetrating a couple areas. The front edge is just barely there. So what would I do? Turn up the heat. Roll the plate, undo it again. I don't think I'd turn up the heat just yet. I want to see some consistency. Now, if I get that, I'm going to turn up the heat. Because I saw this, that's position, that's good. And usually what you see, you guys have done this, see this, you see that story, welding this way, what's that tell you? Cold start. Cold start. Why is it cold start? Too long of stick out. Too long of stick out. Position. Background. Gun angle. Maybe background, yep, could be. Trying to initiate. So that could be a cleaning protocol, that could be an occupation protocol, that could be not cleaning my table before I put it down, all those things. I'm, I'm learning about this welder just by doing this process. If a guy asks me, you know, do you have any grinders I could use? He's already told me something. Do you have a better ground clamp than this? This one has no spring in it. Do you have a set of vice grips I could use to hold this down to the table? I'm learning about this person. You guys use welding helmets here, or does you all of us <laughs> use gloves? <laughs> you know, that's like, you go down there on the average production day, I would be scared to do this tacking test because it, I don't think people here can weld with helmets. They all weld like this, right? Wait, and we all do that. You can't weld by braille? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Works good. Yeah, really good. Yeah. There are people that drive like that. Yeah. Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the actual uh, um, test. Well, qualification. <laughs> think what they are. So on the weld qualification, the guy, guy looks at it, he says, I can do this well, but what are you going to test, right? We get down and we do the one, what, 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 what do we call this? One, 
G, because it's a groove weld. It's not an F, because it's not a fillet weld, right? It may have fillets in it, but it's considered a groove weld. So, what are we going to test? Well, this is quite nice. We're going to do a 150 millimeter coupon, 6 inch coupon, 3 8 thick, or uh, whatever we're trying to achieve for thickness, typically 3 8 somewhere 3 8 half an inch, could be. We're going to throw away the beginning, we're going to throw away the end. Get rid of it. I'm not really good at my starts and stops. We'll sort that out. But I need you to come into this and give me the best you got. Because right here and right here is where I'm actually going to test that stop. And because you're a good guy, I'm going to test the start as well. Do I want to do this on a fellow that's just walked in the door? I know nothing about. No. But in here, I'm going to put you in a probationary category for four or five days. If you know that we start at seven and here at quarter to seven, you're probably going to make it to the end of that week. Now, at the end of the week, I'm going to need you to do one of these tests. You think you can pass this test? Oh, jeez. I come with wings. I say, oh, that's right. You're the one that rides that gold wing. Yep, I got it. Okay. Um, if you want to do some practice, you can do some practice. We'll have some coupons for you. you go ahead and practice all you want. Next week, I'd like you to do a weld certification qualification. But what do you want me to do? Well, weld from here to here, stop. Restart all the way through. Then I want you to come in from here to here, stop. Restart all the way to the end. When you've done that, I want the bottom of that weld completely covered. No gaps, no holes, no porosity, nothing. After that, I want you to weld that up nice and consistent. And then I want you to finish it with a nice cap that's no more than 10% reinforced over the width of the weld. We're then going to grind this down nice and flush. You're going to show me how well you can grind. We're going to take the backing bar off the back and we're going to grind that down. Either we're going to plasma it off or we're going to gouge it off if we want to validate gouging. Um, or we'll get it machined. And we're going to cut it to length. And then I want you to cut three strips out of it. Those strips here inch and a quarter, inch and a half, thereabouts. But what's really important is I need those radius just a little bit on the edges, and you cannot make them any thinner than they were to start. So you can't grind this thing down so it's one eighth thick in the middle here and hand that in. It's not gonna work for you, okay? And then we're gonna do a root and a face bend. That's it. So this is considered a destructive test. It is destroying the consistency of the welded plate and it is testing the tensile values of the material and the weld in this case. A 1G. So if I asked you, have you ever done a 1G? That is typically your groove weld test in 47.1 as a part of your welding codes requirement, right? Has anybody in this room done a 1G? I've done a 1GF. You've done a 1GF because? Fillet. Because? Why did you do a 1GF, not a 1G? Because I wanted the fillet certification as well. That's right. Because we may want you to do fillet welds in the shop. So instead of doing two tests, two tests, we can do it in one test. We can combine them. The code may allow variance 
to the process of testing. No problem. Why do people get nervous when you do a well test? Because they suck. <laughs> <laughs> Shot. No. Well, you actually get two. Okay, you get two shots in most cases. Because you never put all your eggs in one basket. Old saying. So you always have two coupons ready. The inspector comes in, stamps both of them, usually gets one out there, gets you going, then he stamps your second one in case you fuck that up. You know, you screw up the root pass or you screw up the cap pass, which are the ones you always screw up. Uh, right? He knows the story. Shut up with the story. Take your next plate and go. I had a guy do an aluminum test. Again, this is stuff that comes to mind, but interesting. So I've got my CWV inspector standing there. We're doing uh, research on aluminum cert. Okay. Um. Puts his plate down, tacks it up. Whatever. Oh, that's a great bill. Two G. So it's on its pedestal, he's got it on a pedestal off the table, and away he goes, he's blasting away. And I walk by, because I'm the welding supervisor, I'm not the inspector here. And I said to the fellow, I said, did the inspector actually look at that plate? Did he you see your stop start? He said, yeah, he just told me to carry on. It's upside down, isn't it? Yeah. Well, only if you're a qualified welder. <laughs> this is a A-level pressure certified welder. This is no slouch. This guy is, this guy actually is one of those guys that can stand on one leg and do it upside down while smoking a cigarette and pouring in consistently. Just had a bad day. Maybe he likes overhead bills. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in this particular case, I said, well, carry on, but I want you to go over there and ask for your second plate. I want you to do both. Just in case we have a bad outcome here. So, you know, you're walking that ethical boundary. What do you do? Um, I'm not going to embarrass the inspector because the inspector clearly had a bad day too because he knows what the guy's certifying for because it's stamped into the plate. But as the welding supervisor, I guess ethically you have to say, okay, what's the goal here? We need certification in 2G. Um, let's get that second plate employed. Now, do you want to let the guy go ahead and finish it? Sure, let him finish it. Don't get him rattled. Um, he knows he's made a mistake. Let him practice on this, and he will, he will likely be lucky. Um, but in case he's not, we've hedged our bets. That's it. We roll it out. But I, you know, you'll get this stuff happens. It's just like, oh, okay. Two weekends ago, a guy calls me over from down the road. He says, I, I got to do a little bit of a weld repair on, a, on an outboard motor, right? It's that time of year. The ice is off the lake. We've got to go fishing. Shit, the fin's broken off the outboard leg. Peter, come on over, give me a hand. I bought this brand new welding machine. He actually bought himself a 251 with a... Um, Spool gun. Spool gun, thank you. <laughs> the the only here. thing with the wire in here. <laughs> and he says, I can't get it going. Okay, it looks like mine. It feels like mine. Whatever. I had some wire. I brought him some wire. Hook it all up. 
he says, I got, I got the argon all set up. I start welding. I can't get this thing to run. Like it's dirty, it's cold, it's full of porosity. I check the wire, I check the tip, I check the feed, check the voltage and the amperage and something wrong. I'm not getting gas flow, but I can hear the gas flow. I'm really scratching my head. I go over and I'm looking at the bottle. It's, ar it's argon, argon mix. What are you doing with an argon mix? He says, well, it's argon. I said, no, it's argon CO2. It's gotta be pure argon. He says, well, I told the guys I wanted pure argon. So he asked, supplier gave him something completely different. He hooked it up, doesn't know. Now, here's me trying to weld the bottom of the fin on. And I'm amazed how much weld I got in that it was good, that was full of porosity. Um, so you gotta grind it, gotta get it all out, and away you go, you can fix it. He went back to the store, got argon, I finished the weld for him, it was all good. But I was amazed how much I got done. It was actually holding and reasonably consistent. Um, I wouldn't encourage you to do that, but miracles happen. Okay, so what's happening now is we're upping the T classification. So we're going to thicker metals to change that outcome so that the guy gets broader range of qualification. So it looks the same, but we're trying to up this to a higher level. So that's what's going on here. And you'll notice that now we enter into the side bend requirement because it's so thick we can't bend it in the root and face, we now get into the side bend scenario. Or, and this is a bit of a crapshoot, you might just send it out for x-ray. A lot of companies just send it out for x-ray and it's cheaper in the long run because there's less labor. Um, and so on, these are different types of variants for testing. Pipe test balls, and so on. Okay, so the guy says, well, how good does a well have to be? Here's your profile chart. So this is your standard profile chart, nothing mysterious here. You can have a fleet weld, you can have a standard um, belt weld, multiple stringer pass belt welds, and so on. What's our profile acceptance? What's undercut? What's not undercut? What's uh, um, or rollover or overfill, what's that look like, etc. So these charts will show up, the same chart shows up in W59, this is just your standard weld profile configurations. Figure 14. We talked about radiusing off the uh, root and face bends, here's the discussion on that. Oh, I've never done that before. Well, here it is. There's no mysteries in this shop or any other shop. It's all in the book for you. I want to build my own jig to bend my coupons. Those are the parameters around the jig configuration. So this is important when you're going from one code to another. Because if they use a different jig, then the standard of tensile is different. So as long as we all use the same J, and the interesting thing is ASME uh, and CWB are identical, but AWS is a little bit different. So that's where the difference is, is assessed, and that's the tooling that is used. And then the band outcomes obviously are the same um, at the end of the day. We want to tension 
this well in the same way every time we test, test, test it. Uh, this is a guided bend test or a mandrel test. Uh, the other one is a standard uh, vertical hydraulic plunger. And that is the test for the tack weld. And heaven help the guy that does four inches of weld on a four inch plate. We won't fucking talk to him again. And the rest is procedure qualification. So what's the difference between a procedure qualification and a qualification test? Liam, start talking. Liam? He should have told me to put that horse in. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll help you. Procedure qualification is I'm trying to build a welding data sheet. That's a procedure qualification. Qualification test is you say you're a good welder, here's a qualification test. Qualification test is done on the procedures that I have in my shop. To get a procedure in my shop, I did a procedure qualification test. Okay? Um, why would I do a procedure qualification test? Because I'm going to do that test over and over and over. Or sorry, I'm going to do that well over and over and over and over and over every day. That's why I do a data sheet, and then I test people to that data sheet through a qualification. Make sense? Bring that back. Attaboy. That's why research are handy. Because some of this stuff you get in that first three days, and then some of it you get the third time you go through the course. Mm -hmm. And so do that if you get a chance. Just do that research. I actually failed my aluminum research the fourth time around. Fourth time? Fourth time. I started arguing with myself. It was great. It was a great, you should have been there, sitting in the freaking hotel room arguing with myself. And I Yeah. Did I had to go back and retest. So Peter, you already got this. Don't talk to me. Okay, so it goes through how to do everything for qualifications, where the cuts are gonna be, uh, what we're gonna do based on the thickness of the metal and so on. A procedure qualification, uh, all said and done, to get that data sheet, seven to 10,000 bucks by the time you're said and done. A lot of money invested. So when a company has a pile of them, if I have 60 of these, 600,000 bucks, could be. Some of them might be cheaper than others, but certainly it's going to be a week's wages for somebody in the shop to validate that weld. It's going to be a week's wages for an inspection company to validate that test. I've got to have my welding supervisor there, I've got to have my welding engineer there, I've got to have a representative from the CWB there, I've got to be a certified company to do it. And that's why I say seven to ten grand by the time you're said and done. If you take this home and you work in your toolbox, you forget to bring it back, consider theft. So please don't do that, okay? There's a way around this, which means standard welding procedures live online. So the, C, the Bureau as a, as a point of membership gives you access to a lot of these online. And so I can reference an online procedure and not have to go through the testing to get there. Um, because they recognize not all of us have the money to do this. Um, the other thing if you're a brand new welding supervisor and somebody says, I need to do a procedure qualification test, where the fuck do I even start? 
So there's lots of help out there, again, online. Um, this one was done in 1988. So uh, in 1986, I did my first welding supervisor course. I couldn't even spell welding, never mind supervisor. And in 88, I was building data sheets. Um, yes, we had welding back then. Most of it was stick. In this particular case, it was stick. Um, and this was a flat position V group buildup. But we did a pile of them. Um, as we had to get this company going and certified. Um, so that's a data sheet. That's a procedure qualification test and how to get there as far as the con components of it. We roll right through. This is what the x-ray guys are gonna worry about. We're not gonna worry about it. And we come in here. What does the engineer have to do? Lays it out in Annex B. So these are your annexes. What is the information that has to be on the data sheet? Here it is, and it lays it out for you. What is the stuff that should be in the WPDS? Or sorry, sorry, the WPS, I always do that. And this is the general statement. So I'm a brand new supervisor, I don't know how to write these documents. The code will help you. It will say, tell me what you want to put on this line, etc. And it will prompt you to things that you should be talking about. And now the brand new person that comes in as a part of their orientation package, this is the shitter, this is the pisser, this is what you do here, this is what you do here. No, we don't get into that detail. We just say this is the washroom, this is the muster station, this is what we do in an earthquake and a fire. And with regard to welding, here's some information on welding. We lead people to success. Um, just by the way, this is, as you can see here, identified for flux core, but it goes on. Gas metal arc goes on. Sub arc and a stick and so on. So you can have a WPS for each category, each process, you're golden. That's it, that's W47. We walk through the whole code in Questions on 47. You have a better feel for what 47 is about. Shut up, please. Smart ass sitting back there checking on me. Are we good? Okay. Let's take, let's take five minutes to shake.